Hello, my name is Yuan Zhou. This is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2021 meeting of the Society for Mathematical Psychology. I'm presenting my work titled Exploring Dual Process Models of the Balloon Analog Risk Task. People are faced with choices like running a yellow light or smoking a cigarette every day. These risk decisions are often not one-shot and deterministic, but made repeatedly and involve uncertainty. Sequential risk-taking tasks are designed to study these decisions, and they have a unique advantage of incorporating learning and exploration in the decision process and making different demands on our cognitive systems than one-time risk choices. Therefore, they have the potential to reveal more than a single construct of risk-taking propensity. The Balloon Analog Risk Task, or the BART, is one of the most widely used sequential risk-taking tasks. It involves sequential decisions with increased reward for every choice, like the diagram shows here, and the potential reward goes hand in hand with increased risk of losing. To get more information from the task and depict the underlying cognitive processes, computational models have been developed. Most of the existing models of the BART assume a single response pathway that is controlled and attention demanding, and the models mostly describe deliberate and calculated decision processes. We here refer to them as single process models. Here are at least the three most promising models that were found by past studies to outperform their competitors, the BSR, BWMV, and SDL. However, recent evidence suggests that aside from the controlled and calculated evaluation responses, an automatic and effortless response pathway could also emerge in the sequential decisions. This figure published by Plaska and Wershbo shows the average RTs as a function of pumping opportunities during a trial. It is clear that there was a delay at the beginning of a trial where participants were assumed to be deciding the target number of pumps, then the RTs get quite fast in the middle until the participants reach a point where they want to stop and the RTs got slower. This pattern, among other results, have suggested that having multiple response pathways could better explain the observed choices and RTs in these decisions. And this is in line with the prevalent idea that human cognition involves two main families of processes formalized as dual process theory. Most dual process theorists refer to the two information processing systems as a fast and automatic system one and a slow and controlled system two. Therefore, the current state of modeling the BART could be advanced by applying a dual process framework and building models to account for both choices and RTs in these decisions. Plaskak and Wishable also laid the groundwork for modeling the multiple uh, systems in the BART and proposed the first dual process model of the BART named DRBSR. This model assumes that the probability of an assessment choice is first determined by a logistic function, and if the choice is non-assessment, which could be considered as system one, the participants are assumed to make fast and automatic responses, and the RTs are modeled by an X Gaussian distribution. For the assessment choices, which could be considered as system two, the choices and RTs are modeled using a standard drift diffusion process combined with BSR. While the DRBSR model provides a promising dual process account of the decision processes underlying the BART, it also reveals some unanswered questions, like are there other ways that the two systems interact with each other, such as sequentially connected? And is BSR the best way to describe the distance to target evaluation in assessment choices now that we have newly proposed single process models as promising alternatives? Lastly, could the non-assessment choices be modeled differently from an X Gaussian distribution? With the framework provided by the DRBSR model, we take on these questions, and the goal of this project is to advance the modeling of the BART by applying a dual process framework and exploring alternative model configurations and their implications. As a first step, I developed a set of dual process models, and I will briefly describe the general framework here. The first configuration is the interaction between the two systems. A popular perspective in decision making is that the two systems are connected sequentially. 
meaning that system one starts first, and at some point, system two kicks in, forming a two-stage process. Or it can be competitive, meaning that only one of the two systems dominates each choice, giving us a one-stage process. Then for the distance to target evaluation in system two, it can be modeled by the three promising single process models mentioned earlier. Thirdly, the drift rating system two could also be varied, which can be either stationary over trials or changing with experience. Last but not the least, for system one, instead of an X Gaussian distribution, I used a standard drift diffusion process, which was the same as for system two, providing a more coherent framework. The drift rating system one can be either a free parameter or a function of trial and opportunity. With these variations, the initial pool of computing dual process models in our study consisted of 24 models. We then assessed the performance of these 24 models using a model comparison study. The first test was parameter recovery. Here I show an example of the best performing model in terms of the average correlation coefficient between estimated and true parameter values. We can notice that the parameters in the top row were recovered very well. These parameters are directly related to the calculation of RTs. For example, they are represented in choice threshold, which is equivalent to the boundary separation parameter in the standard drift diffusion model. It's very recovered well in all models. Similarly, the drift rating system one, the bias to use system one, and the sensitivity to task exposure all perform satisfyingly across the best performing models. However, those in the bottom row perform worse, and these parameters are all from the single process models that are involved in the evaluation process. This could be caused by the fact that many of the choices in the middle of a trial were fast and automatic, and thus used only system one, leaving a few observations for the estimation of these parameters. And also the computation of the probability of choices were rather complicated, also making it harder to estimate these parameters. A second test was to evaluate predictive accuracy. We collected data from 98 participants and fit the five best performing models from parameter recovery simulations to calculate the leave one out information criterion. The one stage models consistently outperformed the two stage models in terms of parameter recovery, but we still included three best performing two stage models here just for comparison. Again, it is clear that the one stage models on the bottom outperformed the two stage models on the top shown by their lower LOIC values. And out of all these models, the FC1 STL model performed the best. We also looked at the absolute model performance in terms of predictive accuracy, which was mostly in line with previous results. Here are some examples of the best performing models. The models tend to overestimate the number of pumps, giving us a higher adjusted score, which is related to the worst identifiability of the evaluation parameters. But the RTs could be generally well predicted by these models as shown here. Given the results from the model comparison studies, we noticed some patterns. The first one is that the one stage models consistently outperformed the two stage models, suggesting that it is more likely that the two systems operate competitively in the barge and only one of the two systems dominates each choice. This is different from the popular point of view in the field of decision making, indicating that how the two systems interact with each other could actually differ from task to task. Results also showed that integrating task exposure in the calculation of drift rates improved model performance. This is not surprising as the incorporation of more parameters and more information should lead to a better depiction of the underlying processes. Not only do participants adjust their pumping strategies based on experience in the task, how fast they make the decision could also change with experience, and incorporating task exposure in the drift rates successfully captures this. Lastly, in the model comparison tests, the models using STL to describe the evaluation process were found to generally perform better than BSR and EWMV when other configurations were the same. 
the SDL model directly updates the target number of pumps for each trial and did not involve any calculation of the probability of losing. Our results suggest that this model could be more accurate for the evaluation process in the decisions. With the winning model, the next step is to examine the validity of the model parameters. This step checks whether the parameters truly represent the underlying construct that the model assumes. Specifically, we targeted at the parameters that could be reliably identified as listed here. These four parameters characterize the two systems in dual process theory and are specifically related to the description of observed RTs. I used an experiment to test predictions about how decision processes change in relation to system one and system two by examining whether the parameter estimates changed in the expected direction. I first implemented a manipulation where a working memory task was added to the decisions during the barge. Working memory load has been suggested to selectively influence system two processing. And in the current model, this could be exhibited in the bias to engage in system two processing, leading to decreased tau. Increasing working memory load could also induce cognitive fatigue, making participants more likely to feel tired and change their behavior more drastically, reflected by increased beta. Another group included individuals diagnosed with hoarding disorder who had difficulty deciding on the value of stimuli. This indecisiveness and difficulty in value evaluation could mean that these participants need more evidence to make a decision, and there is a greater likelihood of utilizing system two for evaluation. Therefore, the hoarding disorder group should have increased theta and decreased tau. Additionally, deficit in information processing speed has also been associated with hoarding disorder, so this group should also have decreased phi as well. We fitted the most promising model, FC1STL, to all groups of data using hierarchical Bayesian analysis. These are the group level parameters posterior distributions, and we calculated 95% highest density intervals as criterion for detecting a credible difference between groups. The working memory group was hypothesized to have decreased tau and elevated beta compared to the control group. The results were in line with the hypothesis as indicated by the comparison between red and black lines in these two plots. The hoarding disorder group was hypothesized to have increased theta, decreased tau, and decreased phi. Comparing the green and black lines in these two plots, theta and tau showed credible group differences as expected. Parameter phi did not show credible enough group difference, but it was in the direction as expected. And just as a side note, we also fitted the existing DRBSR model to the same set of data, and the group differences in the corresponding parameters were either smaller or not credible, indicating that DRBSR was less sensitive to these constructs than the current FC1 STL model. In general, the dual process modeling approach could help us decompose the underlying mechanism and better understand how people take repeated risks in real world situations. The experiment results indicate that the FC1 STL model offers valid parameters that represent choice threshold, drift rate in system one, bias to use system one, and sensitivity to task exposure. These parameters could not be captured by any single process models, and they could reveal information characterizing the two systems according to dual process theories. Therefore, this model offers a method of attributing differences in observed behavior, especially RTs, to the differences in the involvement and the interaction of the two information processing systems. The results here are part of a larger project, and I am happy to share more results we have in the live Q&A session. Lastly, I would like to thank my advisors, Dr. Mark Pitt and Dr. Jay Miao, and thank you for your attention.